Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Dr. Mel Etienne. I'm the Vice Chancellor for Diversity and Inclusion uh, here at New York Medical College. Um, and this evening, we'll be having our Black History Month uh, event. And I'm glad to say that uh, one of our guests this evening is uh, our former governor, David Patterson, who I'm, I'm glad to say that uh, I do remember uh, his inauguration. I had the honor and pleasure of actually being in attendance um, at the inauguration uh, through a, a, a friend of mine who was able to help secure <laughs> a ticket to that uh, wonderful event. Um, in addition this evening, we're, we are going to have uh, Dr. Halpern is going to be uh, speaking uh, after the governor to give us a, a nice history of New York Medical College, particularly as pertains to African Americans uh, uh, at the college, our rich history that I know many of you may have heard part of it before, uh, but there's a lot more information that Dr. Halpern uh, looks forward to sharing with us this evening. Um, and, I, and I look forward to us receiving uh, that information. Um, in addition, uh, we have numerous posters of our NYMC alumni um, that will be revealed uh, this evening. Um, obviously, we would have liked to reveal those posters in person as we've done in the past uh, in our, uh, in the medical science building, the lobby area where we can have a, you know, everyone view the posters in person. Unfortunately, due to the pandemic, um, we'll be doing that in a virtual format. Um, and they, they are still, I would say, still very beautiful uh, posters and uh, numerous students from the Student National Medical Association uh, will be participating um, in presenting uh, those posters this evening. Um, we also, also joining us this evening will be, uh, will be um, Mr. I think that's, I think that's, those are the, the main, main, main uh, presentations. So uh, without further ado, I am going to turn over the uh, mic to uh, Mr. Nicholas Webb. Uh, Nicholas is our uh, archivist here at New York Medical College. Uh, he has been doing a tremendous job of going through our history um, and, and getting a lot of this archival information for us. Uh, Nicholas Webb will be introducing uh, Governor uh, David Patterson. Nicholas. Good evening. My name is Nicholas Webb, and I am the college archivist and curator of historical collections in the Health Sciences Library of New York Medical College. We're gathered here this evening to celebrate Black History Month and to the honor of the accomplishments of a group of New York Medical College alumni at the turn of the 20th century, who were both leaders in medicine and leaders in their community and in the struggle for civil rights in Harlem. As we unveil these permanent historical exhibits, the posters you will be seeing tonight will be hanging permanently on campus in the physical space. We are very proud to be sharing this history with you tonight. On behalf of New York Medical College, I am proud to introduce Governor David Patterson, 55th Governor of New York State, and Distinguished Professor of Healthcare and Public Policy in the Turo College and University System. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Webb, and, and thank you, Mr. Etienne. This is, of course, the first uh, we hope in a series of African-American history celebrations and poster collage uh, that will occur this evening. And we're going to have a lecture on uh, Black History Month by uh, Dr. Edward Halpern, who is the chancellor and uh, chief executive officer of uh, uh, the medical school and also the provost for biomedical affairs for the Torridge College and University System. I thought I would just try to put Black History Month in perspective because we have a lot of months that we celebrate uh, history. Next month will be Women's History Month. Um, uh, between ha halfway through September to halfway through October is Hispanic history celebration. Uh, Columbus Day symbolizes the Italian uh, immigration to the United States. St. Patrick's Day symbolizes the uh, Irish migration to this great country and Pulaski Day, the Polish uh, ascension on the United States of America. But what separates Black History Month from the other events is that almost every 
uh, issue in black history is coinc coincidentally a part of American history. So the first Africans that came to our lands were not slaves, they were explorers. When Columbus sailed the ocean blue in 1492, there were two Africans in his party. When Balboa conquered the Pacific, there were 30 African American Africans in his party who uh, would have become Americans if they lived long enough. But uh, the issue of slavery began in 1619 to 1863 and was the most barbaric slavery the world had ever seen, where people were uh, 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 just regularly bought and sold, raped and uh, violently murdered. And of the migration of those 30 million Africans, only about 18 million of them actually survived. Uh, interestingly enough, in Article 1, Section 2, Clause 3, of the Constitution, it provides for slavery in Article 4, Section 2, Clause 3, provides for the recovery of runaway slaves. A section has never been taken out of the Constitution, by the way. And it's interesting that to determine uh, electoral votes in the election of a president, the Southern states fought for the African slaves to be uh, uh, to be tabulated as three-fifths of a person. In those days, they said three-fifths of a man. So therefore, though the state of Pennsylvania had a population four times of that of the state of Virginia, they had equal representation in the Electoral College and in Congress based on that new uh, pronunciation of what the population would actually be. So all the great events from the Louisiana Purchase of 1803 to the Missouri Compromise of 1820, the Compromise of 1850, the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854, the Dred Scott decision of 1857, and then the long struggle uh, after the uh, resolution of the Samuel Tilden Rutherford B. Hayes presidential race in 1876, the resolution was that the Southern states could go back to managing themselves in exchange for the Republican Hayes being the next president. And that really created uh, the end of uh, any attempt to try to bring equality in this country. It took uh, bloody lynchings, long marches, and uh, legal cases brought by the NAACP and others to finally bring a Supreme Court decision in Brown versus the Board of Education of Kansas in 1954 the Federal Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Voting Rights Act of 65, and the Housing uh, uh, Act of 1968. So when we look at all of these events, we realize that Black history is really the enhanced discussion of American history. And that if American history can reflect real change, then there has to be some contrition and some penance for the barbaric way the uh, explorers and the settlers treated the natives who lived in this country and then the slaves who they imported into this country. And as we look forward right now in a time of great unrest in this country and great division, uh, one point in black history and American history, I think we should remember that the Supreme Court decision in 1857 in the Dred Scott case did not actually hold that there could be uh, no, there could now be slavery north of the 60, uh, 36th parallel. That had been resolved in an earlier case. That decision held that since Dred Scott was considered three-fifths of a man, he was not a full human being and could not sue anyone in the United States court. As drastic and dreadful as that was, as horrifying as it was to the abolitionists, and as shocking as it was to other Americans that couldn't believe the court would actually say that, when you look back at history. It was only six years before Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation on January 1st, 1863, which had to be amended on September 22nd because the Emancipation Proclamation didn't cover the neutral territories. But the point of it is that those people who were so downtrodden and hurt when the court ruled against them were only six years away from establishing freedom for the slaves in this country. So although things may be very controversial and very uh, antithetical and very acrimonious right now, if we as a people in this country respect each other and work hard, then we can borrow from black history 
and add to American history our ability to learn from our mistakes and to improve the quality of life of our condition. Thank you very much. Thank you, Governor Patterson, for that uh, astute and comprehensive uh, reflection. Uh, and I just want to say we are greatly appreciative uh, of you sharing this uh, evening with us and providing those uh, very thoughtful uh, words. Thank you, Governor. Thank you, Mr. Yatin. And um, we'll continue with the program. Our, our next speaker is our chancellor and CEO, uh, Dr. Uh, Edward Halpern, who will be providing us with a historical look at uh, NYMC with a specific focus on uh, African-Americans uh, at NYMC. Uh, thank you very much and good evening to all our friends in the New York Medical College community. Before I proceed any further, I wanna thank Nicholas Webb and Marie Asher and the wonderful team at the Health Sciences Library at New York Medical College for their work in preparing the program for us tonight. I have always said that there is a special place in heaven for librarians and they never fail to confirm that point of view. This evening, I'd like to talk with you about Myra Adele Logan, a physician of Harlem, and Walter Gray Crump, a surgeon on the Upper East Side of Manhattan, and their roles as surgical and medical education leaders in early and mid 20th century Harlem, and offer you some thoughts about the place of the School of Medicine of New York Medical College in medical care provided by black physicians in Harlem. Um, I will acknowledge that there are uh, photographs this evening that are the courtesy of Chris Miller, who provided me with the pictures of the six members of the class of 1913. And I want to acknowledge the very extensive assistance in archival material of Nick Webb of the New York Medical College Library. Our story shall begin this evening with the story of Myra Adele Logan and her parents. Her father was Warren Logan. Warren Logan was born into slavery in 1857. He was educated at the Tuskegee Institute, what was at that time called the Tuskegee Normal School, later the Tuskegee Institute, and now Tuskegee University in Macon County, Alabama. While trying to travel by train from Montgomery to Selma, Alabama with first class tickets, he was ejected from the train for hesitating to move from his first class seat, which he had bought, purchased. He became the first treasurer of Tuskegee in 1882, a year after it was founded. Myra Adele Logan's mother was Adela Hunt. She was born in 1863 to an enslaved mother and a white farmer father. She graduated at 18 years of age from Atlanta University. She became an English and social studies teacher at Tuskegee Institute. And in 1885, at the age of 22, was named Lady Principal of Tuskegee. She was a suffragette. She lectured at NAACP conferences and she was a published author. Among her books are What Are the Causes of Mortality Among the Negroes of the Cities of the South? And How Is That Mortality to Be Lessened? The marriage produced nine children. There are three children who will play a role in our story this evening. Arthur Logan, a physician. Ruth, the sister who marries Eugene Percy Roberts, New York Medical College class of 1894, and Myra Logan, the central part of our story. Arthur Logan and his sister, Myra Adele Logan, would ultimately establish a private practice of medicine in Harlem. It was called the Upper Manhattan Medical Group, or abbreviated UMMG. If this name sounds somewhat familiar to you, it may be because you are a jazz aficionado. Because 
a song composed by Billy Strayhorn appearing on the right side of the image for the Duke Ellington Orchestra, Duke Ellington on the left side of the image is called UMMG, Upper Manhattan Medical Group, because both Duke Ellington and Billy Strayhorn were patients of the doctors, Logan. And they wrote a song in the honor of the medical practice. Among the early deans of the School of Medicine of New York Medical College was William Harvey King, dean from 1903 to 1908. He was the son of an abolitionist and a, was raised in a home which was a stop on the Underground Railroad in Tioga County, New York. If you look at the overall role of New York Medical College in the education of black physicians serving the medical community, serving the communities of Harlem and surrounding areas, you find an extraordinary story. I believe it is fair to assert that New York Medical College was the first medical school in the state of New York to admit black students. Admitting our first student, a woman in 1869. The first black male student was admitted in 1888. The scholarship we're going to be discussing this evening was established for an entering class of 1929. There were 18 known male black graduates between 1888 and 1929, four of whom we're honoring tonight. Nine of them had undergraduate degrees from Lincoln University, a historically black university in Pennsylvania. This was Dr. Eugene Percy Roberts' alma mater and likely the result of his influence upon others to come to New York Medical College, such as Dr. Reed. The other school in the city of New York to admit black medical students in the 19th century was the Long Island College Hospital School of Medicine, which in 1948 was purchased by the state of New York and renamed State University of New York Downstate Medical Center. Columbia didn't graduate its first black medical student until 50 years after New York Medical College, Cornell 60 years, NYU at some point after that. Indeed, we know that the first black physician to graduate from Columbia University sent at least one of his mentees not to Columbia where he had gone, but to New York Medical College in 1913. So we could fairly assert that by the time of World War I and the great migration and the Harlem Renaissance, New York Medical College had already been practicing, New York Medical College graduates had already been practicing medicine in Harlem for well over 20 years and were practicing elsewhere in the tri-state area. Among the interesting aspects of the historical record is how normal this appears to have been treated at New York Medical College. Here's an advertisement from 1911. The medical students are having a dance. The great Thanksgiving dance for the high price of 50 cents admission will take place on November 30th at the Manhattan Casino on 150th Street and 8th Avenue. You'll notice a list of members of the planning committee, all black graduates of New York Medical College. Now, by our views of today, it seems rather tame since you can see that the dancing takes place from 12 noon to 6 p.m. It was, of course, a matinee, but freely advertised, all invited. Here is the graduation announcement in one of the black newspapers of New York in 1913 of New York Medical College, the 53rd annual commencement of the college. Among the graduates of the college, the newspaper notes, were six Negroes. They have all done exceptional work on the wards of the Flower Hospital in the dispensary. They have served in the outpatient department and each doctor also received a diploma from the Metropolitan Hospital on Blackwell's Island for in one year's attendance on clinics there. Now, if you do the arithmetic of the graduates, six graduates, divided by 44 is 14%, 
Within the last few years, there have been years when the School of Medicine of New York Medical College had the highest percentage of underrepresented minority graduates of any historically majority school in the United States. We also note this evening that in 1913, the School of Medicine of New York Medical College had a higher percentage of black graduates than many allopathic medical schools in the United States will have in 2021. Here are four of the graduates of that year. This photograph courtesy of Chris Miller. Here is another article from that era. Families in Harlem, what are they doing? Majority of working age are helping to support home. The Hinton brothers, educated by aunt, now provide for our attending school at night. George studying to be a minister, James to be a doctor. Let's take a look at the Hinton brothers. The Hinton brothers come from Sunsburg, North Carolina and move in with their aunt, Mrs. Armacy Allen, who cared for them when their father and mother died. George, the older brother, is going to work while going to school at night and hopes to be a minister. Little brother James is attending evening high school with the intention of entering the Flower Fifth Avenue Medical College, New York Medical College, to study medicine. Both men are active church workers. Now, this is important to note that a black teenager before the First World War aspires to go to medical school and has role models to go to medical school at New York Medical College. If this name, James Hinton, is familiar to you, it is not because he became a doctor. This is the Reverend James Hinton, who becomes a minister, moves to South Carolina, leads the South Carolina NAACP, and is a well-known figure in the civil rights struggle. Our story now combines with that of a graduate of New York Medical College School of Medicine in the 1890s, Walter Gray Crump, author of poetry in his yearbook. He will be more familiar to the students of New York Medical College from this image. Uh, this portrait appears in the Medical Education Building at New York Medical College, showing him in his doctoral robes, green piping and three green velvet on the sleeve to show the degree doctor, green being the color of herbs, being the academic robe for medicine. Here we see Surgeon Crump at the bedside with four house officers looking at a child. Walter Gray Crump, interest in civil rights, originates with his parents, his father, Samuel, was a stonemason from England who settles near Rochester in the 1830s. His father ran a stop on the Underground Railroad. It is very important to note that they live in Rochester. Rochester is where Frederick Douglass moves when he doesn't like living in Boston anymore. And the Crumps were friends of Frederick Douglass. They were also friends of John Brown. Crump becomes a trustee. Crump becomes a trustee of the Tuskegee Institute, later Tuskegee University, and of Howard University. At Tuskegee, he helped organize an annual surgical seminar for black surgeons from throughout the country. Now, uh, many of you know the name Tuskegee and increasingly people know the name Howard University. Among the famous graduates of Howard University are the former mayor of the city of New York, David Dinkins, and the current vice president of the United States, Kamala Harris. We have photographs of Dr. Crump doing surgical continuing education at Tuskegee at the turn of the last century. One sees in the photograph roughly 100 black physicians and the bearded image of Walter Crump. He would hire a private train between New York City and Alabama so that travelers to the Tuskegee Surgical Seminar would not have to travel on a segregated train. He was referred to in the journal of the National Medical Association, the Black Medical Journal, as a stalwart champion for the civil, professional, and economic rights of minorities. Dr. Crump helped establish a racially integrated hospital in Manhattan, the International Hospital 
which stayed open for a year at the beginning of the Great Depression. I invite you to look carefully at this photograph, a group of dignified gentlemen at a club meeting in Manhattan. And you see here, seated, second from the left in the first seated row, Walter Gray Crump. You notice a black man to his right. That is Eugene Percy Roberts, who married Myra Logan's sister and was a friend and colleague of Dr. Crump. There is evidence to suggest that the two of them discussed establishing a scholarship for black students at New York Medical College. It was done and the headline of the New York Age in 1929, first award Dr. Crump Medical Scholarship to Myra Logan. First scholarship in medicine is granted Miss Myra Logan at New York Medical College, created by Walter Crump, distinguished surgeon who set aside income from, from $10,000 as a perpetual scholarship fund. You will have noted that I have not told you much more biography about Myra Logan. I've saved it for this slide. This slide is just too charming not to use in some detail. A newspaper article, New York Girl Wins Medical Scholarship. The scholarship recently established by Dr. Walter Gray Crump for the exclusive use of a quote, deserving Negro and Negress desirous of studying medicine, close quote is the only known one of its kind in the country granted by a medical college. Miss Logan is the first to benefit by it. Miss Logan is an alumna of Atlanta University where she received an arts degree out of Columbia University where she obtained her master's degree in 1928. She is the sister-in-law of Dr. Eugene Roberts of 130th Street who was a commissioner of education of New York City during the John Puroy Mitchell administration. Dr. Roberts is a graduate of New York Medical College class of 1894, holds an MA from Lincoln University. Dr. Crump, donor of the scholarship, which will enable Ms. Logan to take up a four-year medical course, has been interested in the advancement of Negro welfare and education. His father, Samuel Crump, active abolitionist, maintained one of the first underground railway stations which many slaves sought and obtained freedom in the North. His father was on lecture platforms with Susan B. Anthony in the struggle for women's rights. Dr. Crump has conducted special surgical clinics at the Andrews Memorial Hospital in Tuskegee, Alabama with the annual pilgrimage to Tuskegee. It was fostered each year by William J. Shifflin and Julius Rosenwald of Chicago and the Board of Trustees of Tuskegee. Does that name sound familiar to any of you? Julius Rosenwald? That's the Sears Roebuck fortune and the Rosenwald schools for providing education for black children in the American South provided by Jusius Rosenwald of Chicago of Sears Roebuck. And this is Myra Adele Logan, medical student of New York Medical College, entering class 1929, graduating class 1933. Among the striking aspects of her yearbook entry is how unstriking it is. It is a simple description by her classmates of one of the other classmates, there is no notation of her race. It was treated as a routine fellow medical student appearing in the yearbook. She did her residency at Harlem Hospital. She practiced surgery at Harlem and Sydenham hospitals in New York. Of great importance this evening is that one year after the Blaylock, Towsig, Thomas, open heart operation, the first in the world, at Johns Hopkins, the first open heart surgery performed by a woman in the world was performed by Myra Adele Logan at the Harlem Hospital. She also conducted research on the use of antibiotic oreomycin and improved techniques of mammography. I have reviewed this issue with the American College of Surgeons and we may fairly assert that she was the second black woman ever to be elected to the American College of Surgeons. This is Dr. Logan during the time of her medical practice. I invite you to look carefully at the picture. So you're going to see another image of her in a painting and see if you recognize her in a few more slides. Here she is at the bedside of a patient at Harlem Hospital, surrounded by her colleagues. 
I invite you particularly to note the man in the white coat standing to Dr. Logan's right. That is Dr. Lewis Wright, who led the desegregation of the medical staff of the Harlem Hospital and whose daughter was Jane Cook Wright, School of Medicine, New York Medical College, class of 1945, another recipient of the Walter J. Crump Scholarship and one of the founders of the American Society for Clinical Oncology and the first black physician ever to be named a dean of a historically majority US medical school when she became a dean at the School of Medicine of New York Medical College. This is Jane Cook Wright. In 1948, New York Governor Thomas Dewey, one of Governor Patterson's predecessors, appointed a commission to look into legislation for discrimination remediation. Among the individuals appointed to the commission was Dot Myra Adele Logan, but she resigned along with seven other members when Dewey shelved the legislation drafted by the committee and asked the state legislature to set up a new panel to study the problem. She was also active in the NAACP, Planned Parenthood, and the New York State Workmen's Compensation Board. Now, I think this question of what happened in 1948 is worth some additional study. Governor Dewey expended considerable political capital in 1948, trying to directly address the problem of discrimination against Blacks, Irish and Italian Roman Catholics, and Jews being denied admission to medical schools, law schools, engineering schools, and the higher education system in New York. In 1948, he vigorously advocated for the creation of a solution to this problem, the SUNY system, including the creation of the first public medical schools in New York. So before we really understand what was going on here with Dewey's battles with the legislature in 1948, I think this question of Dr. Logan's placement on this commission and resignation would deserve some additional historical study. If you enter the entry lobby of the Harlem Hospital, you'll see a large mural. Depicted in the mural is a nurse holding a baby. Does that nurse look familiar to you? Does she look similar to a photograph I showed you a few slides ago? If she does, it's because this is Myra Adele Logan painted into the mural. How'd she get painted into the mural? Because she married the painter, City College professor Charles Alston. They met while he was working on the mural at Harlem Hospital when she was an intern. He portrayed her in the mural as a nurse holding a baby. Dr. Logan was an accomplished classical pianist. She was described as an extremely dedicated, able and humane physician whose personality combined urbanity and modesty. On the first floor of the Metropolitan Hospital, there is a historical plaque commemorating the life of Myra Adele Logan. There is a copy of this on display at New York Medical College. In this image, you see the former CEO of Metropolitan Hospital, Alina Moran, standing next to the historical display. This testimonial to Dr. Eugene Percy Roberts for 50 years of faithful service to the practice of medicine in Harlem was awarded by the Manhattan Central Medical Society. And if you look in the lower right-hand corner, you see the signature of Myra Adele Logan. So one might say that there are multiple heroes of the story I've told you this evening. I've told you about Eugene Percy Wright, Myra Adele Logan, Walter Gray Crump and others. But I believe I would be remiss without putting it for a moment in broader historical context. Remember that in 1928, 1929, the United States is experiencing the height of the power of the Ku Klux Klan in the North. The Ku Klux Klan controls the State House in Indiana. They are a powerful political force throughout the North. Indeed, they vigorously lobby the governor of the state of New York, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, not to put into nomination for the Democratic nomination for president, Governor Al Smith, 
because of the Klan's opposition to Roman Catholics. The Klan violently opposed to Roman Catholics, Jews, and Blacks. Governor Roosevelt ignores the protestations of the Klan and does give his famous speech to nominate Smith. But it is important to note that in this era, with the enormous power of the white supremacist movement of the Ku Klux Klan, during the time of a 1928 contested election, the New York Medical College was pleased to accept the Crump donation for a scholarship only to be given to black students and put the scholarship into implementation. And that I believe is also worth noting and celebrating this evening. Great things are happening here at New York Medical College and they have happened here in the past. We have a very honorable past. We have an exciting present. And we have a great future. Thank you for including me in the program this evening. Thank you for listening. I'm now at the audience's disposal, Dr. Etienne, for any questions or comments. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Halpern, for going through that uh, rich NYMC history with us. And uh, definitely appreciated seeing some of those, the, those slides and learning more about some of our alumni. Um, the first question I see here is from Dr. Richard McCarrick. Um, and he says, does NYMC still award the scholarship named Crump Scholarship? I'm sure the answer is yes, because it was awarded as a perpetual scholarship, which means it's in the permanent endowment. However, Dr. Crump gave $10,000. So at the current rate of spinning off interest on the endowment, that would hardly pay for four years of medical education at a payout rate of four and a half percent. So uh, you've given me, Richard, a homework project to find out how much the endowment corpus has grown over the last uh, 100, rough, just under 100 years and see how much money it's spinning off now. But uh, if we took it as a perpetual endowment, it's a perpetual endowment. Okay, we have another question here from Edward James Gardner. Would, would grad students be eligible for the Crump Scholarship? I imagine that means the ones who are not uh, medical students. As far as we can tell, Dr. Crump specifically left it for the pursuit of the MD degree. So the answer would be no. Uh, he clearly had a goal of training uh, this, of these scholarships for, uh, for future MDs. Uh, there are, however, uh, lots of other scholarship funds that can be put to the purpose that the questioner has uh, asked about. But one of the rules of charitable gifts are that one follows the directives of the donor as long as they're consistent with the mission of the school. And based on what we have in writing, Dr. Crump very specifically said it was for scholarships. I think it's very interesting that he specifically put men and women in 1928. That was, in addition to the creation of the scholarship, that was also very forward thinking and, uh, and quite progressive for its time. All right, the next question we have uh, from uh, Ronald Jacobson. How, how do you explain this history of liberal acceptance of minority students? Uh, thank you, Dr. Jacobson. I think we can trace this to the founder of the college, William Cullen Bryant. You must remember that William Cullen Bryant as a newspaper editor and a political activist in the 1850s supported the abolition of slavery, supported the emancipation of slaves and granting them the full rights to vote, supported votes for women, supported the rights of workers to form trade unions in the 1850s. He supports a Illinois lawyer for the Republican nomination for president over the Senator from New York, William Seward. In fact, William Cullen Bryant introduces Abraham Lincoln at the Cooper Union speech. So it should not be a surprise that we ended up with a New York Medical College, which within three years of its opening is admitting women to medical school. Within nine years of its opening is admitting black students to medical school. Has the first scholarship for a black student of a white majority school appears to be the first allopathic medical school, I'm sorry, the, yes, I'm sorry, the first MD program in the United States 
to have a Jewish dean in the 1920s, the first to have a black dean. I think this all traces to our historical cultural DNA from William Colin Bryan. All right, thank you. The next question, did NYMC, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, did NYMC precede Morehouse Medical College in its support of black student uh, medical education? Well, um, oh, absolutely. I, I, New York Medical College is much older than Morehouse. If you look into the history of black medical schools in the United States, there were many in the 19th century, but uh, Morehouse was not one of them. Morehouse is one of the younger schools in the United States that was set up targeting uh, increased enrollment for minority students. The uh, first medical schools for specifically established for black medical students in the United States are from the 1860s forward, such as the creation of the Freeman's Medical School, then named in honor of General Howard, Howard University School of Medicine, and then a group of missionaries in Tennessee creating the Meharry Medical College. So those are the oldest in, uh, in history. There are also Leonard Medical School in Raleigh um, and uh, the uh, Louisville Medical College, another historically black school. So yes, for all of those, New York Medical College is far older. Yes, uh, indeed, Meharry was founded in 1876. Let's see if we have any, okay. Any other questions? These are some very good questions. And that last question was from Dr. Srinivasan. Thanks once again, uh, Dr. Halpern, for that uh, wonderful uh, lecture. Um, so again, I'm Dr. Uh, Mill Etienne, uh, Vice Chancellor for Diversity and Inclusion uh, here at NYMC. Uh, I have no conflicts of interest uh, to disclose, and I don't have uh, slides either. Um, the, um, you know, every year uh, there is a theme for Black History Month. Uh, this year's theme for Black History Month is uh, Black family, uh, representation, identity, and diversity. So I encourage everyone this year as part of your celebration of Black History Month to reflect on this theme and what it actually means. Um, as we celebrate Black History Month with our community, uh, I think it is great to reflect on NYMC's legacy. Uh, you have heard that during the 19th century, uh, NYMC started admitting African-American students uh, despite the segregation policies that were present in the United States, uh, many of which you heard about from Governor Patterson this evening. In 1896, uh, Plessy versus Ferguson upheld the constitutionality of racial segregation laws, uh, a doctrine that became known as separate but equal. But uh, here at NYMC, we had black students of African ancestry getting their medical degrees and going on to contribute to society as physicians. Um, this week uh, on President's Day, I was speaking with someone who made a comment that I've heard many times, and I'm sure you, many of you have heard it also. This person asked me, uh, why is it that Black History Month has to be the shortest month? Um, my reply was that it does not have to be the shortest month. Um, it happens to be that Black History Month started out as National Negro History Week and was intentionally made to coincide with the birthdays of Abraham Lincoln and Frederick Douglass, which also happens to coincide with the founding of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Then in the 1960s, uh, thanks in part to the Civil Rights Movement, uh, Negro History Week evolved into what is now known as Black History Month. And in 1976, President Gerald Ford officially recognized Black History Month uh, here in the United States. Uh, I probably provided that person with far more information than they were looking for, uh, but he did thank me uh, and he moved on to complete his, the remainder of his errands uh, for, for his President's Day weekend. Something else that's often expressed, people often express to me, uh, why is it that we have a Black History Month? when we should be recognizing the contributions and achievements of Black people 
to U.S. history every day of the year. Um, it is useful uh, to go back to what President Gerald Ford said in 1976 when he first proclaimed uh, February as Black History Month. He called on everyone to, quote, seize the opportunity to honor the too often neglected accomplishments of Black Americans in every area of endeavor throughout our history. In other words, President Ford was saying that we have to be intentional about recognizing the accomplishments of African Americans, lest we forget. Indeed, Black history is a significant part of US history and world history. However, sometimes we do not always hear the entire story. And so it is important that we continue to intentionally recognize that Black history. President Ford was reminding us that it is important to remember the con that the contributions of Black Americans to U.S. history matters. So yes, we take a month to focus on how much those Black contributions really do matter. Um, as we reflect on the past century and think about the contributions of African Americans to U.S. history, I know most people have heard about Hattie McDaniel, uh, the first African American to win an Academy Award, uh, Jackie Robinson, who broke the color barrier in baseball, uh, John Johnson of Ebony Magazine, Rosa Parks, Harriet Tubman, Nat King Cole, Sojourner Truth, Muhammad Ali, Maya Angelou, uh, Arthur Ashe, Mary McLeod Bethune, uh, George Washington Carver, Charles Drew, Duke Ellington, Marcus Garvey, Langston Hughes, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., the Honorable Thurgood Marshall, Charles Hamilton Houston, President Barack Obama, and there are so many others. We've gone through two world wars, wars in Korea, Iraq, and Afghanistan. And I'm going to share a story from one of those wars. As you know, on December 7th, 1941, the United States was attacked in Pearl Harbor. Doris Miller, a mess attendant who was working on the battleship West Virginia when, Par when Pearl Harbor took place on, this, on that day. The Navy Times reports that Miller carried his mortally wounded captain to safety then took it upon himself with neither orders nor training since African-Americans at that time were only allowed to be messmen in the Navy uh, to fire an unarmed and unmanned machine gun at incoming Japanese planes. When the West Virginia subsequently sank, Miller was among the last to abandon ship, pulling several injured sailors with him as he swam ashore. For his gallantry during combat, Miller received the Navy Cross, the Navy's third highest honor at that time. Doris Miller's contributions on that day mattered a great deal. Well, now fast forward to 2021. Last month, we saw the first African-American, Kamala Harris, sworn in as Vice President of the United States. And we saw a remarkable young poet named Amanda Gorman deliver a stunning inauguration poem, the title of which was The Hill We Climb. She concluded that poem by saying, for there is always light if only we're brave enough to see it, if only we're brave enough to be it. I will now proceed to present the permanent poster exhibit honoring Dr. Eugene Percy Roberts, MD, class of 1894, whose life embodied the values of medical excellence combined with mentorship. In memory of Eugene Percy Roberts, MD, class of 1894, 1868 to 1953, he is known as the Dean of Harlem Physicians for nearly 60 years of service as a medical and civic leader. He's the first black member of the New York City Board of Education, 1917, mentor to a generation of black physicians at New York Medical College. Eugene Percy Roberts, MD, class of 1894, was one of the leading black physicians in New York City for more than half a century. Prominent in civic life as well as medicine, Dr. Roberts was an active figure in politics and culture during the Harlem Renaissance. At New York Medical College, he was a mentor to a generation of black physicians, many of whom went on to hold important medical and civic leadership roles. Dr. Roberts was born in 1868 in Lewisburg, North Carolina, to parents who had been enslaved prior to emancipation. He received his bachelor's degree in 1891 from Lincoln University, a historically black college in Pennsylvania. In 1994, he, I'm sorry, in 1894, he received his MD from NYMC, 
and established a practice in New York City. He was among the early members of the National Medical Association, established in 1895, and served as its New York State Vice President. At the time, most New York City medical schools did not admit Black students, but in the two decades following Dr. Roberts' graduation in 1894, nearly 20 Black students received their MD degree from NYMC. Like Dr. Roberts, these students were mostly graduates of Lincoln University and went on to practice in the New York metropolitan area. Dr. Roberts was the heart of this connection. Medical education at the turn of the century included a period of study with a preceptor, an established physician to sponsor the student, vouch for their potential during their admission to medical school, and allow them to shadow their private practice. Dr. Roberts often served as preceptor for these students. Dr. Roberts' mentees included members of his own extended family with whom he shared a home and eventually an office in Harlem. His younger brother-in-law, Arthur Logan, MD, went on to become a prominent Harlem surgeon and was the personal physician to noted American composer, Duke Ellington. In 1929, Dr. Roberts' sister-in-law, Myra Adele Logan, MD, class of 19, 19, 1933, was the first recipient of NYMC's Walter Gray Crump, Crump Scholarship, the first scholarship for black medical student at a white majority medical school. Dr. Logan would go on to become the second black woman to be elected to the American College of Surgeons and the first woman of any background to perform open heart surgery. In addition to his medical prominence, Dr. Roberts was a political and civic leader in the Harlem community. He was a co-founder of St. James Presbyterian Church a prominent Black church in Harlem. In, 19, in 1898, he was co-founder of the first Black-run Democratic Party organization in New York City. And in 1911, he helped establish the National Urban League. In 1917, Dr. Roberts was appointed by Mayor John Peroy Mitchell to the New York City Board of Education, becoming its first Black member. His wife, Ruth Logan Roberts, was a prominent suffrage and civil rights activist. And the family were friends and patrons of many artists and writers during the Harlem Renaissance of the 1920s. In 1952, Harlem's New Age newspaper ran the 84th birthday profile of Dr. Roberts. By then, he was the oldest practicing physician in Harlem, described by the age as the Dean of Harlem Physicians in recognition of his more than 50 years of service to the community. He died the following spring. His obituary noted that throughout his career in medicine, the Black community in New York City had grown from 18,000 people to three quarters of a million. Some of these had been patients of Dr. Roberts. Many more had been the patients of his students. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Etienne. Thank you, Dr. Halperin. And thank you, Governor Patterson. I'd like to remind you that tonight's event is eligible for continuing medical education credit. 28SHOW all capital letters is the activity code for this event. And you can receive credit by texting this code to 828-295-1144, by logging into eeds.com in your web browser to enter the code, or by scanning the QR code on this slide. Once again, that is 28SHOW, all caps, and you can receive credit by texting this code to the number shown here, by logging into eeds.com, or by scanning the QR code on this slide. On behalf of the Health Sciences Library at New York Medical College, I would also like to invite you to join the upcoming book club discussion of Dr. Damon Tweedy's Black Man in a White Coat. This series of discussions will take place over a period of four months and is sponsored by the Health Sciences Library, the Student National Medical Association, and the Office of Diversity and Inclusion. An invitation to sign up for this book club will be coming soon. Finally, on behalf of New York Medical College, I would like to thank the estate of Wynold Rice for granting permission to reproduce the beautiful portrait painting of Dr. Eugene Percy Roberts that we just saw on our permanent exhibit honoring Dr. Roberts. This painting is part of a series of Harlem Renaissance portraits by Rice and is now in the permanent collection of the New York Historical Society. I will now turn the camera over to members of the Student National Medical Association chapter at New York Medical College who will be unveiling permanent poster exhibits honoring three highly accomplished BAC alumni, some of them students of Dr. Roberts, who received their MD degrees from New York Medical College in the early 20th century. Thank you. 
Hi, I'm Radab al Nafedi of the class of 2023 at New York Medical College, secretary of the NYMC chapter of the Student National Medical Association. George Epps Cannon, MD, class of 1900, was a physician and civil rights leader in New Jersey, where he was a prominent political activist and led local and national campaigns against lynching and segregation. Dr. George Cannon was born in 1869 in Carlisle, South Carolina. Inspired by, a, inspired by a prominent local pastor, the young Cannon resolved to attend Lincoln University, a historically black university in Pennsylvania, where he paid his tuition by working as a Pullman car porter. He received his bachelor's degree in 1893 and later received an honorary law degree from Lincoln in recognition of his civil rights activism. In 1896, he enrolled at New York Medical College under the preceptor, preceptorship of his fellow Lincoln University and NYMC alumnus, Albert Sidney Reed, MD, class of 1895. Dr. Cannon received his MD in 1900 and settled in New Jersey, in Jersey City, where he established a thriving practice. Dr. Cannon's prominence as a physician soon made him a leader in New Jersey's black community, and he became active locally and nationally in the civil rights movement. In New Jersey, he chaired the Committee of 100, a group of black leaders who waged successful campaigns against segregation in local restaurants and against a racially targeted curfew law. Nationally, he was active in the campaign to pass a federal anti-lynching bill. And in 1923, he chaired a delegation of black activists from 18 states to US President Warren G. Harding in support of the bill. In 1924, the same year that his fellow NYMC alumnus Paul Augustus Collins, MD, class of 1913, attended the Democratic National Convention as its first Black delegate, Dr. Cannon was a delegate to the Republican National Convention, where he continued to advocate for an anti-lynching bill. For many years, Dr. Cannon served as Executive Director of the National Medical Association, NMA. In the years following World War I, he led the NMA's campaigns against the segregation of the medical staff of the Tuskegee Veterans Administration Hospital and for the appointment of Black physicians to positions of equal responsibility in the medical units of the U.S. military. In 1916, in response to the success of D.W. Griffith's white supremacist propaganda film, Birth of a Nation, Dr. Cannon founded the Frederick Douglass Film Company, one of the first Black-owned movie studios, whose films highlighted Black achievement. The studio produced four full-length films, including a courtroom drama and a documentary on Black soldiers in World War I. Dr. Cannon passed away in 1925. His funeral in Jersey City, New Jersey, attended by overflow crowds, included the reading of a condolence message from U.S. President Calvin Coolidge. According to historian Dr. Graham Hodges, whose book Black New Jersey, 1664 to the Present Day, was published in 2019, Dr. Cannon was the most important Black New Jerseyan of the first quarter of the 20th century. Thank you. Hi, I'm Eptisam Zenu of the class of 2023 at New York Medical College, presidents of the NYMC chapter of the Student National Medical Association. Dr. Paul Augustus Collins, class of 1913, was an ophthalmologist and political activist who holds the distinction of being the first Black delegate to attend a Democratic National Convention. Dr. Collins was born in 1885 and raised in Oakland, California. In 1908, he received a bachelor's degree from Lincoln University, a historically black university in Pennsylvania. He attended New York Medical College under the mentorship of Eugene Percy Roberts, MD, class of 1894, and Albert Sidney Reed, MD, class of 1895, both of whom had been members of the class of 1891 at Lincoln. Dr. Collins graduated from NYMC in 1913 and settled in Trenton, New Jersey, where he was a founding vice president of the Trenton branch of the Urban League. After several years in Trenton, Dr. Collins moved to New York City and established a pra practice in Harlem. In 1925, he co-founded the Edgecombe Sanitarium, a private hospital established by and for Black physicians who were excluded from admitting privileges at other New York City hospitals. In 1927, he helped establish a free outpatient service for underserved neighborhood residents at Bethel African Methodist Episcopal Church in Harlem, where he led the ophthalmology and otolaryngology clinics. As a prominent physician and community leader in Harlem, Dr. Collins was politically active. He was a close associate of Harlem Democratic leader Ferdinand Q. Morton and was involved in efforts to increase voter turnout in the Harlem community. 
In the summer of 1924, Dr. Collins attended the Democratic National Convention in Madison Square Garden. His presence as the first Black delegate to attend the convention was widely reported. Dr. Collins remained an active participant in politics in Harlem for the remainder of his life, serving as a member of the New York County Democratic Committee and campaigning for Franklin D. Roosevelt in the 1932 presidential election. In 1929, Harlem's New York Age newspaper reported that Adam Clayton Powell Jr., the college-aged son of a prominent Harlem pastor, had been rushed to Dr. Collins for specialty treatment of a sinus infection. Fifteen years later, Reverend Powell Jr. became the first Black congressman from New York State. In 1930, Dr. Collins became a founding member of the executive board of the Manhattan Central Medical Society, MCMS, the Manhattan affiliate of the National Medical Association. That same year, due to the efforts of MCMS President Louis T. Wright, MD, the medical staff of Harlem Hospital was desegregated and Dr. Collins was subsequently named to the staff of the Department of Ophthalmology. A few years later, Dr. Collins became the first Black physician to chair the department, a position he held until his passing in 1952. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Josh. I'm an M2 at New York Medical College. I'm presenting on one of the four NYMC alumni today, Dr. Harding. Henry Osry Harding, MD class of 1913, was a son of Guyanese immigrants and grew up in New York City. And he enrolled at NYMC under the mentorship of Eugene Roberts. As a student, Dr. Harding was an accomplished musician, playing first violin in the college orchestra and opening the 1913 class day exercises of a solo performance. Dr. Harding's interest in public health began early on. During his fourth year at NYMC, he was named secretary of the committee for improving industrial conditions of the New York Urban League, the beginning of a lifelong career in the service of public health. After graduating, Dr. Harding settled on 7th Avenue in Harlem where he established a private general practice and became very involved in civic life. In 1924, he became chair of the Harlem Tuberculosis Committee, a local branch of the New York Tuberculosis Association. The following year, recognizing that fighting tuberculosis in Harlem required addressing the broader health and sanitary needs of the community, Dr. Harding led the committee's expansion to a general public health organization. He served as its chair for the next five years before passing the position on to his classmate, Peyton Anderson. During Dr. Harding's tenure, the committee sponsored a children's health and dental clinic, information services, lectures, and devoting special attention to the needs of newly arrived migrants. He also encouraged his patients to pursue physical fitness himself uh, being a competitive sprinter. Dr. Harding was also the founding member of the Alpha Physical Culture Club, a community-run gymnasium credited by sports historians with finally introducing basketball to Harlem. From 1921 to 1927, he served as a staff member in the outpatient genital urinary clinic of Mount Sinai Hospital where he was the first black physician on staff. In 1923, he ran for office as a reform candidate for the New York City Board of Aldermen in the 21st district. His platform included the segregation of Harlem Hospital and establishment of a children's health clinic in Harlem. While Dr. Harding unfortunately lost his election to the Tammany Howellback incumbent, he remained very involved in politics. In 1938, he was among the founding members of a coalition congressional committee, a group of Harlem civic leaders who organized to elect a black representative from Harlem to the US Congress. Their efforts bore fruit in 1945 when Adam Clayton Powell Jr. became the first black congressman from New York State. Their efforts bore fruit in 1945, when Adam Clayton Powell Jr. became the first black congressman from New York State. Dr. Harding's role as a tubercul tuberculosis advocate led him to be appointed 
for the board of directors of the New York Tuberculosis Association. He delivered citywide public radio lectures on tuberculosis care as a speaker at WNYC. And in 1943, he was appointed by New York Governor Thomas E. Dewey to the board, board of directors of the State Tuberculosis Hospital at Raybrook in the Adirondack Mountains. I'll now turn the camera over to Mr. Christopher Roker, Chief Executive Officer of New York City Health and Hospital Metropolitan for some concluding remarks. Mr. Roker. I would like to thank Dr. Alexander, Dr. Etienne, former Governor David Patterson, Dr. Halpern, and the New York Medical College students and staff who worked extremely hard to put this wonderful event together. The celebration and acknowledgement of these four pioneers from New York Medical College is so fitting. These black alumni, doctors Roberts, Collins, Harding, and Cannon, helped to lay the foundation for so many more to come. Please allow me a few minutes to celebrate some of our black women and men who are our leaders, physicians today at Metropolitan and at New York Medical College. These are just some of the great people who are helping to mold and train our future physicians. These individuals who make up 13% of our attendings are right now helping to make a true difference in our community and our hospital. Dr. Jennifer Hawley. She is the chair of gastroenterology and hepatic biliary disease at Metropolitan Hospital and assistant professor of medicine at New York Medical College. She graduated from Ohio State University. She also attended Howard University College of Medicine where she developed her special interest in gastroenterology. Dr. Harley was accepted into internal medicine residency at New York Medical College, Westchester Medical Center, and successfully completed a gastroenterology fellowship program at New York Medical College, Westchester Medical Center, and here at Metropolitan Hospital. Dr. Natushka Trenard is our Medical Director of Critical Care Services. She earned her medical degree from Howard University College of Medicine and completed her internship and residency program at Stony Brook University Medical Center. Dr. Trenard completed her fellowship at New York University, Bellevue, and earned a master's in public health at Columbia. She is board certified in internal medicine, pulmonary, and critical care medicine. Her interests include health disparities, asthma in urban settings, and resident education. Dr. Noella Boma is the director of hospital medicine service in the Department of Medicine. A native of Cameroon, Dr. Boma arrived in New York City after high school. She studied nursing at CUNY and joined Lincoln Hospital in the Bronx as a registered nurse. She went on to study medicine at the university in Dominican Republic. Dr. Boma returned to the Bronx to complete a residency in internal medicine at Lincoln and then worked as a board certified MD in the emergency room at Lincoln. She has been at Metropolitan since 2007 as a hospitalist and faculty at NYMC, New York Medical College. She has co-authored numerous publications and has been recognized as hospitalist of the year six times. She is passionate about medicine and educating young doctors. She has also been celebrated as one of New York City Health and Hospital's heroes for her outstanding dedication during COVID-19. Dr. Jonathan Mays is Deputy Director of OBGYN at Metropolitan Hospital. He is board certified in the field of OBGYN and the subspecialty of maternal fetal medicine. Dr. Mays studied at Oakwood University a historical black university founded in 1896, where he received a bachelor's of arts in biology and chemistry. He continued his education at Loma Linda University School of Medicine, 
and completed his residency program at Howard University and a fellowship in maternal fetal medicine at Westchester County Medical Center. Because of his love for public health, Dr. May has completed a master's in public health management and policy from New York Medical College. He also earned a MBA from George Washington University. Dr. Mays has been with us for 22 years. Dr. Delatre Lolo is a board certified internist working as a primary care physician and hospitalist at Metropolitan since 1998. Prior to joining Metropolitan, Dr. Lolo advanced to the Faculty of Medicine in his native Haiti. He completed seven years of dedicated study and graduated as a doctor in medicine. He then moved to the United States and completed his residency in internal medicine at Metropolitan. He has co-authored several publications and has been honored as Hospitalist of the Year. Since the earthquake of 2010, Dr. Lolo has continued to be involved in medical missions to Haiti. As medical director of a nonprofit organization dedicated to the humanitarian aid, Dr. Sean Fullerton is chief of urology department, outpatient services. He received his medical degree from SUNY Health Science Center at Syracuse. He trained in general surgery at Lincoln and in urology at the New York Medical College. Dr. Fullerton joined the urology service at Metropolitan in 2008. He is also practicing attending at Westchester Medical Center as an assistant professor of urology at New York Medical College. He has been actively been involved in the education of medical students, residents, and fellows since 2008. He is an educator and a contributor to the urology residency program providing education in the outpatient service at Metropolitan Hospital. Dr. Denton Amon received his medical degree from SUNY Downstate Medical Center in Brooklyn. He trained in general surgery at Kings County Hospital, otolaryngology at Yale New Haven, and was senior resident in general surgery at Wyckoff Hospital in Brooklyn. Dr. Armin completed his urology training at Washington Hospital Center, Washington, D.C., and fellowship in neurourology at Mount Sinai here in New York City. Dr. Armin was director of urology at Lincoln Hospital before joining the urology service at Metropolitan in 2004. He is also an attending urologist and section chief of neurourology and voiding dysfunction at Westchester Medical Center. He's an assistant professor of urology at New York Medical College. Dr. Elvin Parsons has been a psychiatrist at Metropolitan Hospital for 31 years. He attended Temple University School of Medicine and completed a residency program in psychiatry at Albert Einstein College of Medicine. He has worked at Tremont Crisis Center North Central Bronx, Lincoln Hospital, Montefiore, Phoenix House, Spotford, Rikers Island, St. Vincent's Hospital, just to name a few. He is a psychiatric expert in landmark court cases and has been a psychiatrist for over 45 years. Dr. Orville Palmer is an ear, nose, and throat specialist with over 34 years of experience in otolaryngology. He graduated from the University of West Indies, Jamaica, Faculty of Medical Science Medical School. Dr. Palmer maintains affiliations with Harlem Hospital and Metropolitan Hospital. Dr. Ray Witt is a graduate of Albert Einstein College of Medicine in the Bronx. He completed his residency training in OBGYN at New York Medical College at both the Westchester Medical Center campus and Metropolitan. Dr. Witt has been the third year co-clerkship director for the Department of OBGYN at New York Medical College since 2008. He was previously the site director 
at Metropolitan. He is also the Dean of the New York Medical College Stowe House and also works at the college's Office of Diversity and Inclusion. Dr. Judith Richards is board certified in internal medicine and serves at Metropolitan Hospital as a clinician and an educator. She earned her master's in public health at Boston University in social and behavioral sciences and health services. She earned her medical degree at SUNY Downstate and completed her residency in internal medicine at Boston University. Dr. Richards has the distinction of completing the Empire Clinical Research Investigator Program Fellowship at SUNY Downstate, participating as the investigator in Sprint and Accordion clinical trials. After that, she completed fellowship training in sickle cell anemia at Kings County Hospital. Dr. Richards has a long commitment to providing service to underserved, particularly communities of color. Dr. Emnet Optis is a pulmonary and critical care attending physician. She completed all of her medical training in New York City, attending medical school at SUNY Stony Brook University and fellowship at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. During her fellowship, Dr. Hopkins was awarded the American Thoracic Society Minority Training Development Scholarship for research related to infection in bone marrow transplant recipients. She has worked at New York City Health and Hospitals for over three years and mentors residents in research related to pulmonary disease. Dr. Jason Mack is a graduate of the BS MD six year program from Howard University. After completing his training in New York Medical College, Metropolitan Hospital's pediatric residency program, he joined Metropolitan and assumed leadership of the pediatric residency program as the program director. Since 2012, Dr. Mack has served as the director of Metropolitan's Pediatric Ambulatory Services. He has successfully transformed the primary care services to achieve patient-centered medical home level three designation. Dr. Mack is a fellow of the Academy of Pediatrics and a member of New York City Health and Hospitals Pediatric Directors Council. He is also very actively involved in patient and community health education and outreach and has led the very popular Teddy Bear Clinics for Children at events throughout East Harlem. Dr. Donnell Cummings is a therapeutic endoscopist at Metropolitan and a clinical assistant professor of medicine at New York Medical College. Dr. Cummings completed his undergraduate work at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. He went on to pursue his medical degree at Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine in Cleveland. He completed his internal medicine residency at Cleveland Clinic Foundation and his gastroenterology fellowship at the State University of New York Downstate Health Science University. He pursued his advanced endoscopy fellowship at New York Presbyterian Brooklyn Methodist Hospital. His areas of clinical interest include biliary endoscopy, diagnostic and therapeutic endoscopic ultrasound, and endoscopic mucosal resection techniques. I am so proud and honored to work with these individuals. They are leaders, pioneers in their own right, and teachers who bring a different flair to medicine. Our current leaders carry the proverbial torch of those who have come before and continue the legacy into the future. The advancements in technology have helped us to imagine medical care differently. But the commitment from our providers remains the same. It's that commitment and bond with our past which paves the road to an even better future. In closing, I believe that Metropolitan and New York Medical College are well positioned for the future to continue to provide excellent quality care for our ever-changing community. Thank you for allowing me to participate in this event. Please be safe.